A Taste of Existence is a 1990 interview with the American Jesuit philosopher W. Norris Clark. The interviewer was James Araj and the cameraman, his wife Tyra, for their website, innerexplorations.com. Father Clark died in 2008 and Dr. Araj in 2010. I received a copy of this interview on DVD many years ago from a friend of mine, and since Father Clark's work has been very important to me, including most especially his book, The One and the Many, which I highly recommend, I decided a few months ago to try to make this interview more accessible by putting it on YouTube. I took the copy I had and reframed the video. I tried to bring up the audio level a little bit. I added my own on-screen captions and I cut the video into 13 parts, just giving Father Clark's response to the different questions. I replaced Dr. Araja's questions, for the most part, with title cards. It was only after I was mostly finished with this project that I discovered that Tyra Araj, James's widow, had placed all of the innerexplorations.com videos on her YouTube channel, where they're available for free. I'm going to link the channel in the description below, which includes the unedited version of this interview and a follow-up interview with Norris Clark. So if you like what he has to say, please go take a look at her channel and her videos. I've decided to go ahead and post my full edited version of the video here with this introduction, including my thanks to Tyra Araj and to her channel, which I strongly encourage you to go check out. My hope is that the work I've done here will make Father Clark's philosophy more available to more people and will provoke uh, many of you to pick up and learn more about his work in existential metaphysics. So with that introduction, here is my edited version of A Taste of Existence, an interview with W. Norris Clark. What metaphysics is, I'll be delighted. Uh, it's one of the things I do and I love to do, so I like to talk about it too. Well, let's put it this way, to situate it inside philosophy as a whole. I would like to describe philosophy, at least my philosophy, as the effort, the systematic effort, to illumine our experience in depth and to situate it in a vision of the whole. It's not adding new facts, but it's going down and illuminating in depth the facts that you do have, the experience that you do have, and then setting it in a vision of the whole. That's philosophy in general. Now the metaphysical part, metaphysics, which is the, the um, trying to understand being reality as a whole, that's specifically that part to set everything in a vision of the whole. That's the specific part of metaphysics. Then other branches of philosophy, like philosophy of philosophy of man, philosophy of nature, and so on, but then uh, take a part of reality, but also situate it in the whole. But metaphysics is precisely looking for the overall framework, the uh, harmony, the vision of the universe as a whole, as a unity in its differences, and with some kind of a harmony, the great laws great laws and principles that govern all of being in its unity. Now, of course, we have to start from the being that we know, that our universe around. So it's a quest for understanding our universe. But then as that broadens out, the search for understanding, it broadens out to take in the whole universe. In fact, in some way, all possible universes even. When you get back to a source of all being, then you see that, and, they, and if there can be only one, then you have the source of all possible universes. So it, it starts off with our own universe and then can broaden out and go much further. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think the metaphysician does that by starting with our present experience, starting with that and then beginning to move in two directions. In one direction to go in depth, to go down under the surface appearances and look for what is presupposed to that. And as you go down and down, you finally get in any being, 
that's real, you get down to the basic level, it's actual existence. All the other things are things about its nature, but underlying the whole thing is its actual presence in the universe. So the metaphysician goes down, first of all, to begin to focus on that level. Now, all you have to do to, to, to do that is just to go through the suppositions. You have somebody here, your children are here, and, and you were here, and then I can talk about you, but the presupposition of all talking about you is that you're here. You're actually present. So I can focus on that, not what kind of being you are, but your actual presence here. Then you're doing the work of metaphysics, because that's, that's the deepest level that sustains every real being. It's also, if you move out in breadth, see we went down in depth there, but you can also move out in breadth, in breadth to the whole horizon of reality. It's also that which sums up, which is shared by all real things. So when I get down to your actual presence, that's what joins you in common with all beings, all real beings all over the whole universe. So um, uh, we reach that same level of being either by going down in depth in any individual thing and then going out in breadth. What is in common between all the real things and the, what is ultimately in common is that they all exist. So just by focusing on that, it's just, it's a kind of focusing. It isn't, you don't have to go in some strange place or do some strange esoteric exercises. You just begin to look at the presuppositions. What is presupposed for everything else? And then you hit this radical level of existence. And that's what the metaphysician is interested in. What does it mean to be, to be real? What are the basic attributes of any kind of a real being, insofar as it's real? What are the laws and principles that govern all beings in their interrelationship? Um, and then finally, um, uh, do we need some source of all beings? So um, I would say there's that, really what is going on in the whole thing is a search always for the ultimate, a search for the ultimate roots. Metaphysics, in a sense, might be called radical thinking in the ancient meaning of uh, the root of radical is radix, radices, which mean the roots. So metaphysics is radical thinking, not in the sense of politics, but in the sense of what is the ultimate roots of everything. So it's radical thinking in that sense. And it's driven what drives the whole research, the whole inquiry is what I would put at the very basis of metaphysics, and that's the unrestricted radical dynamism of the human spirit, intellect and will, the radical dynamism of the intelligence wanting to understand all that there is to know about all that there is. That's the radical drive of it. And anybody who has an intelligence, human or angelic, or well, the divine already knows it, but any intelligence, because it's an intelligence ordered towards the understanding of being. Because of that, it has a deep dynamism and drive to try to understand all of being with no limits. So it's that radical drive that leads, that leads on the metaphysician, always looking for ultimates where there's no further presupposition. So metaphysician is, is never satisfied until he gets to ultimates where the mind is quieted. And that's why when you're going down in depth inside a being, you keep going until you hit the ultimate root, the actual existence of the thing. So when you go out in what is common, you keep going until you reach the limit beyond which there's only non-being. So the search for being takes, takes in the entire realm of reality, whatever is real. And the only thing beyond that, in, in quotes, so to speak, is non-being. So you reached an ultimate there. So it's that drive of the mind to know. Now you may ask, well, how do you know that you have such a drive of the mind? Is that just peculiar to some people? Um, it may be a matter of temperament to be explicitly have a deeper, have a, an explicit awareness of that. But I think everybody has that, that drive of the mind and the will. The mind towards being as true, as knowable, as intelligible, and then the will towards being is good. Uh, I can give you a little example of how we all are really um, 
how we have this dynamism of uh, unrestricted search for the good, for example. You could do it in the order of intelligence, but it's more striking in the order of the good. Um, um, I was some years ago in a, in a taxi cab in New York, and uh, this taxi driver was very talkative, and as they sometimes are. And I hate to just to waste time on idle conversation, so I decided to direct the conversation. So um, I asked him if he was happy. He said, well, he said, he said, no, he said, I'm not, I'm not happy, all kinds of problems. Well, I said, what would you need to make you happy? Well, he said, a million dollars. He said, that would pay off my debts, it would solve my problems. All right, I said, now you've got it, now what? Well, then he, then, um, then he built himself some houses and brown. I said, fine, they're all built, you've got those. Now what? Well, he thought a minute and he said, well, then he said he'd get himself a wife. Well, he said, fine, now you've got her. Well, he thought, he said, I might get a couple in, in different parts of the world, you know, in different ports, so to speak. Well, I said, fine, you've got them all now. Now what? Uh, well, then he went on doing travel, he went on and on. And then all of a sudden he stopped and looked around. I mean, I thought we were going to, you know, get hit in traffic. But he looked around and he said, he said, say, what's really going on here? I can't seem to get to the bottom of this. What am I really looking for after all? Absolutely magnificent. In other words, the, his, uh, what am I, and then, then, then I started to talk. But what am I really looking, I can't seem to get to the bottom of it. What he was experiencing was the drive of the mind where you first get hold of the, of the, of the whole spirit. This is the will, searching, uh, searching for the good. But um, we search for the good, then we get hold of some finite good, and we are first are satisfied, we enjoy it, we explore it, then we reach the limits of it. As soon as you reach the limits, the, the spirit rebounds further. As soon as it recognizes it's hit a limit, we find it, it rebounds further. Then it gets the next one and explores that, explores that. As soon as it reaches the limit of that, it, it rebounds again further. And this rebounding goes on and on each time you reach a finite good. And then you can finally set, uh, sit back and totalize the whole process. Nothing finite is ever going to satisfy me. Each time I reach the finite, I rebound further. I mean, what's further? Just as somebody inside of a prison, whenever you're, you're inside of a limit and you know it as a limit, you, you always tend to rebound further. To know a limit as a limit, as Hegel said, is already to be beyond it. In intention and longing, at least. If you're inside a prison and you know it there, you're already in longing outside of it. If you don't know that you're being limited by the prison, then, then, you're, then you're all right. As soon as you discover the limit, you rebound again. So that's an indication we have a deep dynamism that can only be satisfied finally by the unlimited, the unlimited horizon of all being and of all goodness. So that's the deep drive, that's the dynamo behind the whole enterprise of metaphysics. So it starts going that way and is looking for ultimates, so it goes quickly trying to find the uh, deepest in each thing and then the, um, the most common framework of everything which is the whole of reality. And, and then you've reached the um, horizon of being beyond which it's not limited because beyond it is, is just nothingness. So that's the, uh, that's the drive that gets you going. Then you go down in depth and then, and then out, out to the furthest horizons. And then if you need to go up, finally to explain, you might have to go up. So I tell my students if they're going to do metaphysics, they need, they need two pieces of equipment to get to the local sports store, a pair of um, a um, pair of wings and a diving suit. You need a diving suit to go down the depths of being and a pair of wings to take off and go to the furthest reaches like that. So uh, so okay. that's what the, the matter he's got this drive to know and he tries to go all the way to the limits and being is the is is the ultimate. Beyond it is just non being. Then you've reached an ultimate. Metaphysics of St. Thomas. Well, when I was a child, I always had a great uh, sort of a longing to understand. I used to climb trees and get up to all the high places I could, just trying to understand, sort of sit there looking over things. And um, metaphysicians traditionally back through history or very often 
have been associated with mountains. Great metaphysicians have always loved mountains. And uh, I didn't know that, of course, but um, St. Thomas was brought at the age of six up to the, the um, great monastery of Monte Cassino to be educated by the Benedictines. And that's way up if you've seen it on a height looking out all over the surrounding valleys. But uh, the, the connection with metaphysics and, and um, heights and mountains is that when you're high up like that, you can see how everything fits together. All the valleys, the mountains, how they all fit together to make a pattern. When you're down low, you can see the individual parts, but you can't see how it fits together. And that physical overview vision seems to be a kind of analog of um, seeing how the whole universe fits together. So I had that desire first. Then I first went to study philosophy over in the island of Jersey with the French Jesuits. We had a wonderful faculty back in 1936 to 39, just before the war. We got the last boat back before the war, rather a close call. But, uh, um, but there we had a wonderful group of professors. And there I was introduced. There was a wonderful, dynamic, fairly young professor of metaphysics um, who was a Thomist. And he introduced me to the um, really dynamic contemporary Thomism. I just loved it and just expanded like a flower in my mind. And so that got me interested in St. Thomas. And then, um, and then I read um, there were just a couple of really great books that um, sort of made me as a philosopher. One was Joseph Marischal, the Belgian Jesuit, who wrote um, a book called The Point of Departure of Metaphysics in French, in about five volumes. He went all through the history of philosophy, always looking at each philosopher from the central point of view of St. Thomas, what he was missing. So there was a kind of a thread going through it. Well, he was leading up to St. Thomas and St. Thomas as a synthesis and then going on further. And that um, was a tremendous illumination to me, getting a central point of view in the whole history of philosophy and St. Thomas as the most synthetic and powerful metaphysical thinker to be able to put that together. So that had a tremendous influence on me. And the other great book was that of Blondel, Action, famous 1893 Action, which was all the dynamism of the will this time, uh, towards the infinite, all through the finite. So that was a very powerful, di and, and Marischal's book, he was the founder of what is called Transcendental Thomism, that is Thomism that builds on the dynamism of the spirit, the a priori conditions, somewhat like Kant, but more realistic. And um, um, Marischal was built on the dynamism of intelligence towards being, and Blondel's book was built on the dynamism of the will towards the good. So those two, from different points of view, were giving the same view of the human spirit. And uh, then the metaphysics worked out all the details. So that's what caught me and sort of blew my mind. So my mind was blown from then on. I just love metaphysics, and so I've taught it ever since. Uh, but I'm into, to, but what I got over there partly was the, what they call existential metaphysics, existential Thomism. And that's a, that's a very important thing in the more dynamic contemporary Thomism. The existential Thomism uh, is one that um, realized, which was not recognized by the early disciples who thought St. Thomas was just an Aristotelian with a Christian uh, Christian adaptation, but he's made much more than that. Aristotle was still focused on form and essence as the as the center of gravity of all reality. St. Thomas penetrated through to the act of existence as deeper than essence and the most profound um, component of all reality, so that there was a, a shift of the center of gravity in St. Thomas from essence and form, which had been there in all the Greeks, essence and form were the principal things, and the good, but a shift to existence as the more radical center of gravity and the unity of all reality. So that, that uh, highlighting of existence, he's one of the few, if not one of the only great philosophers in history to have done that, really, to have focused on existence explicitly. They all take existence for granted, of course, they take it for granted and then forget about it and, and examine what things are like and how they work. But he insisted on putting that in the center, 
existence is the is the central piece of the whole thing, and then then God becomes pure active existence, and all creatures limited active existence. So that viewpoint of everything centered around existence is called existential Thomism. It was brought in by Gilson in 1939, his famous preface to the fifth edition of his Thomism book by uh, De Finance, the French Jesuit in 1939, brought in by a number of Thomists all around the year 1939. So I was just getting the beginning of that. When I went back for graduate studies, I soaked myself in that. So mine is an ex what is what they call an existential Thomism, and that's uh, that's quite a richer and um, deeper kind of understanding of St. Thomas that the people before it didn't quite get hold of clearly. So it's really a um, 20th century understanding of St. Thomas, and the texts are clear now, but it took time to, to recognize the point in St. Thomas. Well, see, St. Thomas himself didn't stress his originality. Contemporary philosophy, everybody wants to be original and new. That was not the attitude of the medieval philosophers. They first wanted to situ situate themselves in tradition and then sort of expand it a bit. So he didn't stress the originality. It was where he just quietly interpreted other philosophers as uh, really trying to say or leading up to what he was saying. So he didn't stress his originality. He stressed his strong dependence on Aristotle, who was just coming into the medieval Christian world and was a, a great threat in its pure form. It was an opportunity and a threat because part of Aristotle was quite incompatible with Christianity. So he was trying to assimilate and show how you could adapt to Aristotle. So he didn't stress uh, saying, I'm original, I'm doing something entirely new. He didn't stress that. So the first disciples missed it. One of his great disciples, Baniers, the Spaniard, the Spaniard, Spanish Dominican, a commentator, caught it early in the, I think it was the 17th century. He caught it and he uh, put it in his own commentary, but couldn't get the other uh, commentators and Dominicans to share it. So he once, in great frustration, cried out. He said, um, St. Thomas uh, cries out, existence, existence, and the Thomists refused to listen. They didn't get it. He got it and it got lost. And now they've, Gilson has republished in English a translation of that part of his commentary on existence, a little book, Banyas on Existence. He got it and the others didn't get it. They got part of the vision, but not really the full one. So it was not highlighted. That was the point. It was, if it was there, the essence and existence distinction was there, but not the highlighting of existence as the guts, the perfection of everything, so to speak. Essence was still sort of like a, had its own perfection, which existence realized. But St. Thomas says this, that um, the existence, the act of existence contains all the perfection and essence just limits it down. So it's a centering on existence, which is a very dynamic notion because the act of existence in St. Thomas is immediately a center of activity. That's one of the richest things that any being insofar as it exists, he says, tends to pour over and communicate itself to others. Every being is self-communicative insofar as it can. So as soon as you have a real being, it tends to pour over through action to communicate itself and share itself and get in touch with other things. So um, to be is to be an active presence, a power-filled presence, filled with energy and power and that immediately starts to flow over according to the essence like a river flowing through through banks. So if you want every finite being is like a channeled bundle of existence. It's got this energy inside and the energy then goes out according to the mold or the pattern of the essence. So it's a highly dynamic notion and um, God himself there, well this, this is taking over really the whole Neoplatonic tradition of the self-diffusiveness of the good. Plato and Plotinus uh, didn't attach that to being, which was a lesser notion for them, more limited essence. The good was the ultimate for them. And the good was naturally self-diffusive, generous, self-communicating. St. Thomas took over that tradition and put it right into existence itself. And the good is a function of existence now. 
but he took over that whole dynamic. So um, every being is necessarily, is naturally self-communicative and expansive, an expansive act. And that's what makes a universe. A universe means, in Latin, uni versum, turned towards one, turned towards unity. If things d didn't act, they'd just be isolated monads here and there, sort of like in a darkness, they wouldn't know each other. But in this conception, as soon as they are, they act and they interact. So that's what turns, what connects up all the beings of the universe. They pour over in their activity and hook up with each other, communicate and share, receive and give. And then you have an actively intercommunicating universe. So that's the universe of real existence. Um, a being that doesn't act might just as well not be at all. That's one of the most profound sayings that um, you say, well, um, couldn't you have a being that doesn't act? Well, there's no logical contradiction. If you had it, it's interesting just to, to think that through. This is the kind of thing that a metaphysician would do. Let's suppose that you had a being that didn't act at all. Would that make sense? Well, first of all, nobody else could know that it was there. Because the only way that you know something is real is by its acting. I know that I'm real because I act. I know other things are real because they act upon me. If a thing didn't act upon you, there'd be no way of knowing that it exists. Unless you're God, the creator, there'd be no way of knowing. So a thing might exist if it didn't act, it might just as well not exist. It would make no difference whatsoever to the universe. Yeah, it'd, be, it'd be impossible to know it, and it would be indistinguishable from nothing. So um, uh, that's uh, um, it would be a perfect waste of time to have beings that didn't act. In the, what we want to know about things is what kind of actors are they? You know, if I know one of your children here, it's no good just to see them in the, the outside. I want to know what kind of people, what kind of character and personality. That is to say, how do they act? What kind of actors are they? When you know anything, you always want to know what kind of an actor is it. We don't realize that, but to know the nature. What is a tree? A tree is something that sends out shoots and arms and uh, um, branches and leaves. It slurps up water from the earth. It does a lot of things. So every being is a doer, a characteristic kind of actor. That's how we know things. That's how we know the essence and the nature. So action is absolutely essential. It's the key to the key to all knowledge. The whole optimistic theory of knowledge can be summed up in a sense, in a single sentence. All knowledge of the real is an interpretation of action, period. <laughs> interpretation of action. And the um, disastrous thing in the Modern philosophy epistemology from Descartes on, they cut the bridge of action, dropped out action, and you got all the problems of the bridge ever since. Descartes didn't trust the external world, tried to deduce it all from innate ideas, and then um, uh, Locke and Barclay and Hume said, what we know are our ideas. Then you have the problem, how do you get to reality? So they all cut off action and caught, and then you say, well, how do we know? We've got these like pictures inside of a museum, but who knows where they come from? If they're just there statically, there's no way. You have to catch them in their incoming action, and then you can refer them back to the outside. So action is a real key, not just to the universe as uh, being and unified, but also to knowledge of the universe. Once you've, um, um, exp once you've taken a look at at, at all of reality and what, what is common to all of it, you've hit this, that everything is, each thing that's real, that you, you, you have to say of it, always two things. This is real, it exi this exists, that exists, the other thing exists. You have to say something common of all of them is or exists or whatever term that you want to use in a language or whatever way they express existence. That's something common that must be said of every single thing that's real. Otherwise, it's despair there. So that's the statement that you make of, of every one. Every being compared to every other being, you have to get a synoptic vision. At any being, like my own self, compared to every other being, 
I have to make two statements about it. It is, but it is not the others. It, it is, but it is such. So it is not that. This is, but it is not that. So it both is like all things and that it exists. It's unlike everything else in that it is this and not that. Now those two aspects, the is, which is common, and the this, which is unique to each one. Um, those are two, um, two attributes that must be said of everything real. At least when you have more than one, if you just had, had one, you could just say, it is, that's all. But as soon as you have more than one, you have to say, it is, and this is not that. Okay, then when you examine those two, you discover they're really irreducible to each other. You can't, um, uh, because they're, they're contraries, that they're not contradictions, but they're contraries, because one negates something. And to say, uh, you couldn't have that things are common like each other by the identical property by which they differ. That doesn't make sense. It's not because they're different that they're alike. That doesn't make sense there. So, uh, and otherwise, you would, you, you would say, um, um, if um, John Smith um, exists precisely because he is just John Smith, then everything that exists would have to be John Smith. That's what makes him exist. Or if he's if he if he exists because he's John Smith, or he's John Smith because, then everything would have to have that same. But that's not true because others have existence and they're not John Smith. So these must be objectively irreducible aspects in a thing: the thisness, and then the existence which it shares, because the existence is shared by others. So it can't be just unique here. No, it's also shared by others. So then you have to have to go down in the engine room of beings and say, in each being, except possibly one, there must be some kind of internal structure where there's a this that makes it this particular being, and then which enables it, which gives it, helps it to share existence, and then have that in common with, with the, which it shares with all beings. So you have an internal structure of that which makes things unlike and that which makes things like. And you call one the act of existence and the other you call essence. Then you try to relate those two together. Is um, Could you conceive of existence as something, a minimum common level, and then you add on all the different essences to this and that? That won't work because anything you add on it, unless it already exists, you're adding on nothing. So existence can't be a minimum. Uh, then you'd be adding on nothing to it. So be, there'd be no addition. Existence must be an all-enveloping maximum. And then you'd have to distinguish things by subtracting. So you can say this is, but only so far. So by doing, by putting existence as the basic all-enveloping perfection, and then essence as being a limit, progressive limits, then you can work it out that everything has existence and yet it's distinct. So you couldn't do it by adding on to existence because you can't add anything on to existence if that doesn't exist, be just mental. So existence becomes a maximum and then you subtract. So if, if, if you had, for example, God thinking up the universe, he would think of images of himself. This is like me, but it's not eternal. It doesn't have, it's not uh, infinite and so on like that. So all the different beings would be existence with a set of minuses, more minuses or less minuses. Existence, but the only one that would be existence uh, unqualified would be the divine name, I am, period. No buts and no qualifications, just mm -hmm. I am. And you've said that, as you said, you've said everything, although you, you don't know it yet. Now. How do you get to the necessity that there's one being that's just pure active existence? Well, you proceed through the analysis of um, all the others, um, except perhaps one would have to be um, would have to be finite because whenever you distinguish beings, you say this being is not that being. Necessarily, one of the two must lack something that the other has. Otherwise, they just coalesce into identity. Whenever you say this is not that, 
one of the two must lack something. So um, it's impossible to have more than one pure infinite being. So um, every being in the universe, then except perhaps one, must be finite to distinguish it from all the others. Now, do you need, could every being be finite or limited existence? That's not going to work because then you do one of the basic Thomistic ascents to God that no finite being can be self-sufficient. Any finite being can't, uh, no finite being can explain why is it this much existence and no more. If it were the ultimate, if, if it was self-sufficient, it would be the ultimate source of existence. And then it doesn't make any sense that it would give existence to itself in some limited way. So as soon as it's limited, it means it can't explain why it exists in this limited way, rather than some other way possible. It would need something to select it out. It couldn't choose its own limited mode of existence. So the, the limitation points to the fact that there's something beyond it. And therefore, if no finite can be self-explanatory, you must ultimately get that the only being that's self-sufficient is going to be the infinite plenitude of existence. Anything less points you further. So by working from the, um, from the finitude of existence, limited existence, and everything would have to be limited except possibly one. That would be distinguished from the others precisely because they are limited. So that there could be one and only one pure act of existence that's unlimited. You say, well, there must be that because the finites can't explain themselves. So that's how you'd move that all the others are participated beings. And they can't explain. They can't explain why they have this limited degree. They they also can't explain why they all share the same property. If you take any set of beings that share the same real property, you say, well, now why are they similar? Why are they similar? Saint Thomas says you can't. Whenever you have if two beings are, are uh, share the same property, either one cause the other, or they're both caused by a third. Why is that? It's not because beings are different that they're similar. You can't say it's because beings are different. That's why they all share existence, which is similar. That doesn't make sense. It can't be because they're different that they're similar. It can't be because they're many that they've got this unity. So to explain the similarity that's all of all real beings, you have to go back to some one source which contains that um, is the source of it, and then gives it to all the others. Otherwise, you can't explain. Um, it's not because they're many that they're one. And similarity is a form of unity. So from those two reasons, that a limited being can't explain why it's limited, and secondly, it can't explain why um, it, it can't explain why um, all the beings share this unity. You must get back to one source for that. So for those two reasons, you trace back the multiplicity of being, that you trace back the compositions of essence and existence back to a single source of pure, unlimited existence, and then you stop. And you reach the, because then there's nothing further to ask about that. In other words, it doesn't demand anything further. You would like to know more about it, but it's completely self-sufficient, so it doesn't need anything further. So your questions, uh, this dynamism of the mind then, uh, comes to a rest from that point of view that there's no further to seek. It's the unique, ultimate, infinite source of all being. And then your question stopped there with regard to um, explanation. Now before you talked about a sort of essence being related to existence as a limit as a limiting as a limiting principle an act of existence limited down to just so much existence and no more so it's a principle of limit then what can be said about matter okay matter is actually a further kind of limitation the uh, the two components in uh, all the things we know uh, form and matter form the pattern or structure that makes it to be this kind of being and then matter which which puts it in the material world and enables um, many different examples of a given species so um, 
Form is a kind of intelligible unity of the nature of a thing. Uh, the form of an oak tree, the form of a human being, gives a set of properties shared by the species. And that's the, that's the unity, the intelligible unity. Now, matter is a dispersal of that in an extended stuff. Matter is essentially um, something extended in space, parts outside of parts. So that's, that's a, um, a kind of imperfection of the unity of form. It's spread out into parts then. So matter is a further limitation. Form, uh, um, just a pure form, would be a finite spirit like the angels. It's a concentrated energy, not infinite, but a concentrated energy transcending space. Once you put it down into a body, then it's sort of spread out and diluted, so to speak, spread out across space. So that's a further limitation. So matter, in a sense, is a second kind of limitation. The first limitation of existence is by form. Structure. And the second limitation is spreading it out in space. So it uh, it's, exists, but it's not all together as much. Like inside of us, it takes time for the uh, instructions from the brain to reach all the way down to the body and to the toes and so on like that. So our, our bodies are present, but not totally present immediately. It takes time to, to unify them. They're spread out, in other words. So matter is a further spreading out of uh, form. It's, 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 it's a further, it's a second kind of limitation. However, there is an advantage, though, in matter. If God, in sort of planning the universe, why would he think up material things? Well, this is not in St. Thomas. This is my own theory. Um, God in himself, as we know, not from philosophy, but from revelation, is a tri-personal unity. There's, a, there are, it's, it's a, there's an internal communication of God, Father to Son, and both to the Spirit. So that's an inner community of persons, or perfectly equal. Now, suppose God wanted to say, I'd like to make a universe, and he makes all kinds of angels, of spirits, but each one is going to be different. And he says, suppose I wanted to make a society, a uh, universe where there are societies of equals, equals, where you could have a democracy. Uh, democracy, all men by nature are created equal. Now, how are you going to have many different members of the same species, all equal and yet many? Well, for St. Thomas, you couldn't do that if you just had pure spirit, pure finite form, because um, then, like an angel for St. Thomas, each angel exhausts its own species. Gabriel is Gabriality, but no man or woman is humanity. What's the difference? Um, if you just had the pure form, there's no way of getting another one like that unless you change the, the quality, made a different kind of form. But matter allows you to multiply and reproduce the same specific form over and over again in other parts of matter, because matter just adds quantitative spatial um, difference in, in space and extension, but it doesn't give you qualitative changes. So um, if you bring in a, a principle of matter, then you can multiply individuals of the same form all over the place as, as long as you have more material. Then you can get equals, because matter, the extension in space, gives quantitative differentiation, but not qualitative yet. And therefore, you can have the same species reproduced. Then you can have equals, and you can have a democracy. So the condition of possibility for having beings that are equal, equal, and can share in a society of equals, is having a material universe. And that's so the angels can't imitate God in that. The angels are all uh, qualitatively diverse from each other, not the same species. God wanted to say, well, I'd like something where they're all equals. And he had to make matter. So that's one reason for the material universe. It enables um, societies of equals. And all the things that we know around us, all are many individuals of, the, uh, are individuals of which there are many in the same species, trees and acorns and atoms and all that. So that's the, that enables democracy of equals.
Well, I was right in the middle of all that because I was brought up in Thomas when it was in its heyday and the great, what we call, in this country at least, a bit of a triumphalistic spirit of Thomism. And all over the seminaries, that was the thing, and the, most of the Catholic institutions, St. Thomas was the great authority that you are recommended and supposed to teach. So that was very common. But then, um, after, after the Second Vatican Council, and it had been beginning before, um, uh, there was, uh, Vatican Council was just one sample of a bursting out of all kinds of a new spirit, trying to try new things, and, um, and a playing down of authority. So what happened then, the door was open, so to speak, to um, appreciating all kinds of other traditions, including religious traditions. And then the, the, um, the um, young Catholic scholars just sort of broke away from St. Thomas. They didn't refute him. They just lost interest and moved out into all kinds of other things. They were trained in principally phenomenology and existentialism and various things. So they just sort of moved away from St. Thomas and uh, they, were, they were a bit uh, ticked off or t turned off by the authoritarian aspect that had come into the Thomism. This is the one great authority. And that was very bad news. And St. Thomas would never have liked that. He was a revolutionary in his own day. Several of his doctrines got condemned, sort of officially, not by the whole church, but by the Bishop of Paris. And so they had to rescind those when they canonized them. They couldn't have a saint with doctrines condemned. They thought he was too dangerous. So he was not just a traditionalist. But anyway, he became this church authority. And then finally, there was a breaking of revolt against that authority in many fields. So the young philosophers were just moved away and were trained in all kinds of other things. And it, Thomism went down very precipitously uh, during that time. It had gotten tied up to, I think, with being a little bit of the ghetto um, Catholic mentality that, that uh, to, um, to hold together the unity of Catholic practice and faith and everything, you'd need this one philosophy. We all have to hold the one philosophy to hold the one church. Now that was an exaggeration. So that uh, that, that kind of um, um, monolithic unity began to break up all over the place. We began to welcome other religions more. That monolithic unity and uh, Catholics began to move out in America into outside of the ghetto, into all kinds of, of other places and business and move out into the wider population. So they wanted to break away from this monolithic, too tight kind of unity of philosophical doctrine. So for those many reasons, there was a, and to break the barriers and open up like that. So the Thomism then dropped down to no longer the, there was, there was no more authority. Just, and so it's always kept on as a quiet, fairly strong, but by no means, the only one now. So pluralism is now the order of the day all over the place, even in most Catholic places. So it was a move towards pluralism and away from, from monolithic unity and authority. Excellent question. I'm delighted to answer that. Uh, the young people now have never heard of St. Thomas as an authority. Uh, all that's gone because they, they're their own professors uh, don't teach them Thomas most of the time. So that great burden on St. Thomas of being the official authority is gone. The students are doing anything about that. So they come to him fresh and open. And when I taught in Santa Clara in California, University of Santa Clara, my students there were just amazed. They said, where has this man been? Nobody gives us any visions like this. The modern philosophers, one will say you can't know this, another will say you can't know that. What can you know is not clear. And they're all doing piecemeal work. Nobody gives us great visions like this. So they were just in, enthralled with this. Um, but it was because I presented St. Thomas in the great seminal ideas, not the heavy technical armature that he, uh, that he developed from Aristotle. He's very difficult to approach just on your own. You have to have somebody to guide you in and simplify and streamline from all the heavy technical terminology. Once that's done, the ideas can blossom. And um, I found students um, just very excited at this great unifying vision. 
and Sister Mary Clark, who's an old friend of mine, not a relative, she's been teaching for years, a great Thomist. She's now teaching, she was asked to teach down at NYU, the undergraduates, a course in medieval philosophy. They rarely have that, but they decided, well, they'd do it. And uh, she's teaching that in principally St. Thomas, and she says the students love it. There's some kind of a unity in your life this way. It makes sense, it argues, it, it's close enough to our experience. And a lot of these things read now are so esoteric, you know, they, they can't make sense of it. They were just, they just loved it and said we ought to have two classes a week rather than one. So that they, it's, it's like a thing, this, this idea of a unified vision is what is so tremendously lacking in our contemporary world. We have the pursuit of the part, that some have called the fascination of the part, as opposed to the vision of the whole. And we've gone in for the piecemeal specialization in the part. So people are in pieces. They got all about the parts, but, um, but how does it all fit together into a whole? Nobody's gonna tell them. They said, we don't do those. Some American philosopher said, we don't do that kind of big visions anymore. We do careful piecemeal work. But as somebody said, maybe Jefferson, when, um, uh, uh, when the, what is it now? The people perish when there is no vision. I would say vision of the whole. That's the thing that they miss and that they find in St. Thomas, a vision of the whole. That's why the book that I wrote is called The Universe as Journey. That's a single, tremendous, powerful image summing up in a sense, the entire metaphysical vision of the universe according to St. Thomas. It's a, it's, a, it's a great image or archetypal image that people can understand. The universe as journey, the sense of all beings pour out, creatures pour out from God, the many from the one, they, they, as, as though God throws them out in an adventure, in a journey, they go out first, and then as soon as they exist, he pulls them back towards himself by the pull of the good. And the pull of good, they're seeking each their finite good, but all those goods participate ultimately in the infinite. So the whole universe is then being trying to find its way back to God too, and man along the way as a, as a key point in that. In fact, man is, um, the material world couldn't get back to God without man because the material world doesn't have knowledge, self-consciousness and, and love, so it can't know that it's on a journey and imitating God. So the human being is deep into matter, takes up, should take up the whole of matter, try to understand it, realize it's on a journey, refer it back to the source with acknowledgement and um, love and gratitude to the source. And then material world comes back through the human, through man, through the human being, back to its source. But that's a tremendous image summing up the universe. Well, I think you would first get people um, uh, say now uh, get people in touch with their drive to know. They first of all have to want to know, and without any restrictions. So the theme song of the metaphysician is "Don't fence me in." <laughs> uh, to, to, to get them in touch with that longing to know and get that moving, and then um, and then just start the moving now when you. Or, uh, as I say, to go down in depth and then out in that, and then just to call their attention to what is all around us we take for granted and then forget about. The is, as Shelley said, the, um, um, the mist of familiarity uh, obscures from us the wonder of our being. Existence is so familiar, it's common to everything, that we just sort of forget about it and it drops out of sight, to open their eyes again, to recognize the wonder, as Heidegger said, the wonder of all wonders that anything at all exists, to wake people up. You have to wake them up to look not just at the fact of existence, but the act of existence, to wake them up to the wonder of existence. Now, that's the kind of thing you can do that by various examples. I could, I could tell you how I discovered I could tell you my, my own discovery. I, uh, what I love to do is ask my students, how did you, if you did have a discover, wake up to existence, to the wonder of existence? And you get remarkable stories sometimes. Some have not, but I'll tell you how mine happened when I was about 14 or 15, I guess. I used to love to climb up in high places. 
So I used to climb up the um, the pillars of the George Washington Bridge that had been built not, not too long before. I used to climb up from the riverbed all the way up to the roadbed, which is about 300 feet up those pillars. Um, now, it's not that terribly difficult, but you need good rubber sole shoes and cool nerves. If you if imagine yourself climbing up there, it, it goes like that. You have to be like a monkey. But I, I couldn't do it now, but I was had a lot of courage at that time. So I would climb up and then go across the bridge and then climb up the palisades on the other side. There are places to climb there, the 500-foot-high palisades. And... Um, on one occasion, I was climbing at a place where it said, do not climb here, dangerous. Well, that was the indication of me to go up. So uh, I climbed up there. And then I got about two-thirds of the way up. And then I got stuck. And I couldn't go further. I couldn't reach further. And I couldn't go down. As you know, it's in climbing, it's easier to go up than down because your your eyes are closer to the going up. So I couldn't go down again. I got stuck. And so the cars had stopped on the road down below and they were yelling at me, come down. And I said, I can't come down. I'm stuck. And the police came and they said they were going to arrest me. I said, fine, I'd love to be arrested. Come up and get me because they weren't going to venture up. So I just couldn't get down and I couldn't see how to get up. They said they'd come and, and, and let a rope down from the top. And, and then I thought, gee, I'll get arrested. The family will be disgraced. I'll be thrown in jail and all that. So I figured I've got to do something. So I now noticed there was a little sort of a bulge of rock and I could see around it that there was a place for my feet. There was a foothold. Now, if if there was a handhold, if I swung around, if there was a handhold, I'd be able to make it and escape up, but I couldn't see. So I took my life in my hands and swung out into space around. Now, luckily, as you can see, there was a handhold. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. So I caught it then and then made my way up and escaped into the bushes. By the time the police came, they couldn't find me. I disappeared. But as I swung around and as I swung around into space, I got sort of the taste of existence in my mouth there, how sweet it is to exist. And then I did catch it and I held on to it. But it was at the point of disappearing. And when you, when you can lose something, you suddenly wake up to its value. When you're just going around, there's no threat to you. You forget all about the wonder of your existence. But actually, you know, uh, we're not in charge of our own existence. We could lose it at any moment. So at that, I got the taste of what it means to exist, and I never forgot that. Um, racing riders have told me of racing cars. They've told me that things they love when they go at full speed going up around the track, way up, if they go further, they'll go off and be killed. At that point, they say they get the taste of existence in their mouth. So it can come from, you know, from the point of losing it, it can come from uh, the loss of a dear one. When you realize now the existence, it can come from total boredom, not bored with this or that, or radical boredom with everything, and you bump into existence. So there are various ways, negative and positive, of, of doing that. So you have to wake them up to that experience, the wonder of existence, and that can really blow their minds when it, when it hits them. You have to lure them into it. So they get to say that you shouldn't, in a sense, you shouldn't say a horse exists, a tree exists. You should say existence here is horsey. Existence here is human. Everywhere there's existence. Oh, here's an existence in the horsey mode. So you suddenly see existence isn't added on. It's the all enveloping. And then it's modified here and there. So it's this great fundamental thing that's a perfect wonder because none of the things around us have to be. So that's an, that's what they call an awakening to existence. Uh, if you wanted, I, I could tell you how one girl in my class had discovered that I asked him to write on that. And this was like an ordinary girl in the class, simple, you know, she looked, there was nothing extraordinary, nothing dramatic. When she wrote this paper, it really sort of blew me away. And she said, now, um, you can use this paper, but you must never give my name. Obviously, as you'll see, that when she was 17, she fell in love with this fellow and had this uh, great infatuation. But he was a violent fellow. He would beat her up, really abuse her and beat her up and so on like that, but she couldn't break off from him. And um, then finally she became pregnant, but she decided uh, to carry the baby through, not to have an abortion, to carry the baby through. And he said her parents were very supportive and she and only praised them. They were very supportive and comforting. 
So she carried the baby through, but then when she was delivering the baby, it was a very difficult delivery, and she almost died. And she said she was just about slipping out of consciousness and going when she heard the um, the little cry of the baby newborn and the the contrast of um, her life almost slipping away and the new life coming. She she caught the preciousness of existence. And that was her discovery. That's a hard way to do it. But you can see why she didn't want her name to be used. I had no idea. And then she gave the baby away, as a matter of fact. But um, I had no idea this girl had been through this. But she deeply appreciated existence from the fact that she was about to lose it and then this new existence. So those are the sort of limit cases when you wake up to what we ordinarily just simply take for granted. Well, um, I think so, because for one thing, the vision of St. Thomas shows the universe as one, as having a powerful unity. And the new physics, uh, the Big Bang, you know, is all drawing the universe back. It's not just all these disparate things, but it's drawing them all back into great unifying laws and back even to a single source. So the, the universe and the modern science is turning out to be much more powerfully one than we suspected before. That's one thing. And um, also it, it comes back to simpler, simpler and simpler laws. And all the multiplicity of particles comes down to fewer and fewer. And finally the particles sort of uh, get fused together almost in that, in that initial state. So you're coming down to something almost like, almost like pure energy at the beginning. Now, in the in the the Thomistic vision, what is common to all things is the radical energy of existence. It can be conceived like an energy because it's an it's a, it's an act of presence. It isn't a form or a structure. It's an act of presence and immediately expands like an act of energy. So that uh, the most radical thing in Saint Thomas is the energy of existence. And in this in the um, modern physics, uh, what is the great underlying unity now turns out to be more and more some kind of radical physical energy so that the, the physicists describe the universe as transformations of energy. Notice the two elements there. Form, different forms corresponding to essence, transformations of something that's not a form of energy, which is a kind of an opposite of form. So that's a radical energy, that's the unity, all the universe is through transformations of this mysterious one kind of energy there. So that's somewhat of an analog of existence as the common unity, which is beyond all forms and structures. Existence is not this form or that form. It's precisely a richness beyond it, which is limited by form. And the energy for the physicist is not a form. It takes now this form and now that form. So there's a kind of analogy there. And then the notion of potentiality is very basic in the Thomistic, that things have a potentiality which then unfolds into actuality. And then to understand in the quantum physics today that um, at least in the um, subatomic particles, they are not the same in the reality as the way we know them. When we get to know them and do an experiment, they snap into a more determinate state. So that by doing the experiment, um, doing the experiment, the experimenter gets in, gets gets into the act, and so things are completed, so to speak, by the knower, the physicist, getting into relation with them by an experiment. So that then the question is, well, what are the things before we do the experiment? Now the experimenter is a part of the whole situation in all the new physics, and into and and. Uh, it isn't as though you can observe the universe at a distance, just what it is in itself. No. When you observe it, you also change it and modify it. So we're all woven together now. Then the question is, what could the universe be when, when we're not observing it? Well, some say it's total blank. You can't do it. In, in St. Thomas, you can very well say what you have there is objective potentialities. Potentialities that if we get into, into connection with them, they will show up this way. Like the electron 
uh, we used to think of the electron as a little planet spinning around the uh, nucleus like a sun. That's not, uh, that's not the case anymore at all. When we're not observing an electron, the electron isn't here or there. It's an energy pulse all around the nucleus at once, like, and you can't say where it is. But when we do an experiment on it, the wave packet, they say, collapses, and it comes into a little tiny electron here and not there with a definite mass and so on like that. Now, um, so the electron shows up when we do an experiment. Well, what is it before we do the experiment? Well, you'd have to say it's, it's, it's a, a real potentiality that when you do an experiment, it'll show up as an electron. The wave will show up as an electron. But potentiality can't, can never be described empirically. The only thing you can describe empirically is an actuality. You can't describe the potentiality of something. If, um, if, if, you, if your daughter over there, for example, say, well, she can play the violin. Can you play the violin, the piano or something, or guitar? Well, can you even sing? Okay, you can say, she can sing. Now, her ability to sing, there's no way of describing that ability to sing as an ability. I can't peer inside her and see that. No, I just see the vocal cords. Uh, what I can describe is when she sings, actually, that I can describe and say, since she's since she is actually singing now, I say, therefore, she must have the ability. But the ability can't be described empirically, but it's there. So that enables you to talk about the real world without trying to give a measurement of it independently of the server, that sort of thing. So it's, the world is real potentialities ready to show up this way under observation. Well, um, I'd, I'd like to mention some of the articles that were especially uh, influential because they're not all in these books here, but the, the one that, that I really like very especially is, a, is this one called Action as the Self-Revelation of Being in St. Thomas, a, or a Central Theme in St. Thomas. That really brings out the dynamic character of existence as pouring over into self-communication and with the wide applications of that. It goes all the way up into theology too. The very highest being is essentially self-communicative love. That tremendous image of, of God is self-communicative love. And every being that's in some way is an image of God because it's a participation. So every being uh, would share in some way in that drive to self-communication and every conscious being into self-communicative love in some way. So that's a very rich one. Then I've done one on the person. To be is to be self-communicative, St. Thomas's vision of personal being, where I bring out um, uh, the three aspects of to be a person, to be self-possessing in the order of knowing, of knowing oneself, self-awareness in depth, then in the order of action, self-determination or self-governing of our own lives, of moral response, taking charge of our own lives and being responsible, self-governing, and then to be self-communicative, we must share. We must share what is what is in us to, to share and to get in relation with others. And uh, in, in a sense, um, what you don't share, you're going to lose. The only things you can really hold on to are the things you're willing to share. That seems to be the law of being. That in, in, to the extent that you are, you tend to communicate it. If you don't communicate it, it'll get sedimented over and buried down and you sort of lose it. And then the third uh, aspect is self-transcendence, going beyond oneself and finally taking on the great center of the universe as one's own center, a kind of decentering of self-centeredness. That's the great mystery of the ultimate personal development in all the great spiritual traditions. So that's one that I like because it goes right into the applications to the person of the dynamism of existence, that to be a person you must communicate and share with others. Otherwise, you, you're not. That's the law of being, of every being. And we have. Then you can, you can violate the laws of traffic, traffic laws. You can't violate the laws of being, without getting, sort of crushed yourself. So those two action, and then how that applies to the person, the dynamic, interrelated notion of person, and um, 
and everything as an image of God who is essentially self-communicative love. That's the nature of God inside, inside of God in the three persons and then giving to the universe. So those are two very central things that, that gets from metaphysics of being in general down to the person. So that's a, that's a very central kind of that. And that particular one opens out to all the contemporary contributions of the personalists, the existential personalists, Martin Buber and all those people, the I, thou, intersubjectivity. That comes in. St. Thomas didn't develop it uh, in the same way as the moderns, but it's there in the sense that every person must be self-communicative and sharing that kind of a thing. So those two are um, uh, some of my favorite things. Then uh, in um, in this very recent book of mine, The Universe as Journey, conversations, it doesn't look too serious there, but actually I, I give a basic chapter in there on 50 years of metaphysical reflection, the universe's journey, my 50 years of thinking over metaphysics. And um, in there, I develop as the great unifying symbol, uh, the universe's journey, the many all creation coming out of God, sort of the way out, the road out, the exodus, so to speak, and then the, the, uh, the road back, all the universe being pulled back to God for the pull of the good. And that's the way home. So there's the leaving home and the returning home. That, that theme of, of journey is one of the great archetypal images, as you know, in all of literature and all back through history, the journey. Jung says it's the, it's the fundamental archetype of the, the psychic thing we have to leave home find your own identity, leave the parents, find your own identity. But then when you reach middle life, you have to return again, back home again, back to your sources. So that's a great, a great image that, that I develop in that book. And then three other professors give their own papers discussing partly my thought and their objections maybe and so on like that. But um, um, there's another one that I've, that I've done um, this is my book on the philosophy of God. And um, in here, I develop first the great uh, unrestricted dynamism of the human spirit towards God. The first chapter, the second chapter, the ascent of the mind to God in St. Thomas through finitude and participation. And the third chapter is something that's been a fairly important part of my metaphysical life, a dialogue with the contemporary process philosophers and theologians, which is quite different from St. Thomas. And they're all, they're against an immutable God. They said, that's not a, that's a God uninvolved. So I try to show how Thomism could adapt to take in the best of their insights without losing a great deal of what I think they lose in their process, because the process God is not really the creator and the source of being. So um, that dialogue with the process people is the third and many of them have said that it's the most serious dialogue of the Thomist with the process movement. So those are things I've been interested in. Well, <clears throat> it's never going to be, uh, at least I don't foresee in the immediate future, it's, it's not going to be popular with the professional philosophers. It, it requires it requires quite a quite a bit of training of getting back into that medieval spirit to see where he started from and they're not willing to do that they're all into the more particular modern things so that it's not going to become popular I think among the professional philosophers however I think the students are more and more looking for more synthetic visions of the whole so it's quietly coming back as one option, one kind of alternative vision, one option which they might like to look at. And um, uh, so it is, it is quietly spreading. Now, strange to say, one of the best ways of getting a job in philosophy when you finish your PhD to say you're a specialist in St. Thomas. That would, would have been you know, astonishing to hear some years ago. But that's now the case because so many places would like to have somebody representing St. Thomas. And not the whole department, but that's coming back now. And um, the recent University of St. Thomas in Houston just graduated their first PhDs and people said, oh, they'll never be able to get jobs. All snatched up quickly. No problem. 
So even places like places like Columbia and Princeton are now having a little seminar between them on ethics, and they want to do it on Aristotle and St. Thomas's ethics. The leading ethicist in the country, one of the leading ones, Alastair McIntyre, real hot property, as they say, was a great figure. He's now, he went over to study uh, St. Thomas during the summer in Oxford with his old classmate, Father Herbert McCabe, the Dominican, to study St. Thomas, because he's been drawn into that more and more, that you can't solve the things without something like a natural law. So it's coming back, especially through ethics, more and more. They're very interested in, in the Thomistic theory of virtue and ethics and natural law. It's coming in through there rather than the metaphysics, but they'll be drawn into the metaphysics through the ethics more. So the ethics, he's, he's got a strong place in ethics around the country, steadily growing. The, the, the metaphysics is behind the scenes, but that's uh, just quietly spreading. So that'll be in there as with a real appeal to students I think, and there'll always be then perhaps a slightly growing number of professors will be able to, to do that, and will use that as a um, as part of their repertoire. So it won't be any more dominant, but it'll be a, a uh, respected part of a pluralistic philosophy department. Well. There's a new tool now that has come out that was never available before. It just came out a few weeks ago. This is a new condensed translation of the Summa Theologiae of St. Thomas, the great central work by an English Dominican. Um, and uh, he's um, presented the Summa Theologiae in, in, a, in a new modern form, in paragraph form, instead of all the questions and articles, which breaks it up so much. And he's cut it down to one sixth of the total volume. He's dropped out all these structure of, of questions, objections first, and then answers, and just gives you a running paragraph style treating of the whole doctrine in succession. It's all St. Thomas, but he's dropped out a lot of special questions like the rituals of the old law. Well, that's all those things look about. So he's cut it down a bit and cut down. If there's a very important answer to an objection, he'll weave it right into the text. So for the first time, students can actually read a continuous presentation of St. Thomas's doctrine on a given point without all this broken up structure, the medieval disputation structure. So it makes it's a single volume of 700 pages that condenses the entire Summa Theologica of St. Thomas. It's thousands and thousands of pages. That's, uh, that would be about 4,000 pages. That's a wonderful tool now put out by the Christian Classics publishers in uh, Westminster, Maryland. Just come out, costs $78. But a serious person could just read and just keep quietly reading. It's got all the theology and the philosophy in there. It's a wonderful tool now. It's, it's a nice modern translation, interesting, and, uh, and so on like that. So it's a wonderful tool now, available for the first time, really. So they don't get lost in St. Thomas himself like that. But then, then they would have to read. Um, they'd, they'd have to read various, various modern things, and um, 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 Shields' famous book, *The Spirit of Medieval Philosophy*, is, is an interesting one way to start. Shields also has the Christian philosophy of Saint Thomas, with his special, his famous new chapter on existence, that was only in the fifth edition, and from then on. A new chapter on this existential turn. You could, they could read that, and then um, they could read some of my works there. And um, there, there were various Thomistic textbooks, but they've all they've all gone out of print now. So one has to look around, look around under some guidance to find some good readings to introduce one into into, into this existential and uh, existential and the. Than the Neoplatonic. I've stressed that St. Thomas is not just Aristotelian, but is deeply borrowed from the Neoplatonic participation metaphysics, in essence, and existence. So he's not just Aristotelian. So um, uh, he could find a good bit of that in the bibliography of my works in, in the articles, and I would refer, I would refer to various other works there. So it's one place to start. I can think immediately start with my bibliography, and then that would lead you around to various others.